blessed New Year and blessed Christmas to everyone. I think, you know, the rest of the world, they kind of think that Christmas is over on December 25th. Uh, we join together for 12 days of Christmas. The 12 days of Christmas start on Christmas Day and then continue to Epiphany. And so we are still celebrating the Christmas mystery and the Christmas celebration of God becoming a human being, becoming man incarnate for us. Today we'll be talking about Jesus and his boyhood and what that means for us as we gather together to be uh, worshiping in God's house, in our Father's house. So with those things, our Old Testament reading for this, the second Sunday after Christmas, is taken from 1 Kings. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered and counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked for this. And God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for, your, for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered a burnt offering and peace offerings, and made a feast for all his servants. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading for today is taken from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, the first chapter. <coughs> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. 
apologize for the triple alleluia and the common verse and the reading of the gospel. St. Luke in the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as we were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they, did be, they, did, but then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in, a, in great distress. And he said to them, Well, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? They did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. We confess our faith with the Nicene Creed. <coughs> Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our text today is Luke 2, 49. It's on the front of your cover. I must be in my Father's house. You may be seated. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, there's really not a lot that's written about Jesus' birth and boyhood in the scriptures from the four Gospels. A chapter and a half in Matthew, less than two chapters in Luke, and there's a reason for that. The fact is, is that the four evangelists were not writing 
a biography about Jesus. If they had been writing a biography of Jesus, they would have filled in the, the wide gap between Jesus' birth and when he appears again and begins his ministry at, at the age at 30 years old. Except for this one episode in Acts 2 when Jesus is 12. And the reason for that is all of those other stories that we wonder about and we're all curious about really aren't necessary for our salvation. It's not why the, the scriptures were given to us. The scriptures are given to us so that we may believe, and, and it gives us what we need to believe in order to receive eternal life, in order to receive the forgiveness of sins, and then also teaches us how to live God-pleasing lives. We just sang it in the Alleluia verse. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's what the scriptures are all about. That's the bottom line. And I would suppose that uh, there are all these things that we wonder about. About what it would have been like for Mary and Joseph to be the parents of the Son of God. And we'll just have to wait until we can get some first-hand answers in heaven to have those, those questions answered. In the meantime, we don't need to know. I mean, it's fun to try to wonder about what it must have been like. And it may even seem a little funny to, to hear a story about Mary and Joseph losing their son, Jesus, and then finding him in the same way that probably every parent here can tell a story about a time that you lost one of your kids. I know I can. I lost, you know, at least two of the three at one time or another, and they'd tell you even more. It's, it's, it's comforting, in a sense, to find out that even in the first family of the church, they have the same kind of mishaps, the same kind of misunderstandings that we all deal with in our lives. But that's not the reason the scriptures are given to us, to give us comfort in those things, to, to just to get a laugh. The scriptures are given, us, given to us so that we will know the way of salvation and that we would know how to live God-pleasing lives as God's disciples. Those two things. One is law, one is gospel. And we need to know both. And so when we wonder, okay, why was this one solitary episode when Jesus is 12 years old included in the scriptures, I contend that it's because it does both of those things. It speaks about the way of salvation, but it also gives us examples of what it means to, to be godly people and godly parents. Throughout this Advent season and throughout Christmas, we've been talking about the fact that, that Mary and Joseph are good examples of what God intends for marriage. And here in today's text, it tells us what God intends for parenting. Because the scriptures tell us that, that every year, Mary and Joseph made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. This whole text is an important text, and it all revolves around the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Luther says in the small catechism, we should fear and love God, that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. It's what we are all about here. Now we know that the origin of that goes all the way back to Genesis, all the way back to the very beginning of time when God created this world in six days and rested on the seventh day. Then later on in Exodus, we learn the reason for that seventh day. It wasn't because God got tired. It's not because God needed a break, but God realized that we would need to cycle in some rest and some relaxation in our lives and that if we were godly people who were doing our work, who were working those six days, not only would we need rest, but we would need a time, an open time, a time to devote to learning about God. And so he has established this Sabbath day of rest and and said, rest, not just so you can get the rest, but also so that we can take the time to learn about God, his will in our lives, his love for us, and how we are to live as God's disciples. 
Now, we see this in, in this text, and we see Mary and Joseph as examples of that as they bring Jesus to this day of the feast of, of uh, uh, the um, Passover, the feast of the Passover, which was one of the most important of the feasts that God has established. Now, many of us have learned this commandment, the third commandment is, thou shalt sanctify the holy day. The word holy day is, becomes a contraction when we say holiday, Christmas holiday. We have our holy days too. And this was one of the most important ones, the feast of the, of, of, of the Passover. And so all of these people from all of the region would come into Jerusalem for this feast. And as good parents, they would bring Jesus every year to that feast and that festival. And they were there for the whole thing. They didn't leave early. While they were there, and they're celebrating, it was come time for them to leave. And then they, and, and they, they leave, they go off, and then they, they end up realizing after a while, thinking that Jesus, their son, had been with the rest of the group. And then when they realize that or not, they're frantic, they go back looking for Jesus. While they were looking, we see an example of the third commandment that is even stronger than the fact that they were constantly bringing Jesus to the services of God's house. But when Jesus says in verse 49, he asks the question, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my Father's house? Jesus uses a very emphatic word here. This is a third commandment issue here. This going to church was not an option for Jesus. This was a necessity for Jesus. He says, I must be in my Father's house. And we live in a time when there is no set-aside day. I can remember when I was growing up, stores were not open on Sundays especially liquor stores. And in the, you'd go to the grocery store and they'd be cordoned off. You couldn't buy beer on a Sunday. You, there were places, most places were closed on Sundays. It was set aside. Now you look around and there are more than enough activities to fill anyone's day always on Sundays. No wonder we have trouble getting people to worship on a regular basis. There's a difference now than what it once was. There are just too many things that, that draw us away. Too many times where people in this era who will ask the question, do I have to go to church? Do I have to go to church to be saved? To go to heaven? It's not just children that are asking, adults are asking that question. I hear it all the time. Well, let's take a look at that. It's one of the commandments, of, first and foremost, one of the Ten Commandments, Third Commandment. So, does God forbid, tell us that we shall not murder? Does God require that we not be adulterers, steal, lie, covet? And the answer to all of those questions is, yes, God requires that we do not do those things. And so when we talk about worshiping the Lord, does God require that too in the same way that he requires that we not do those things, that we not misuse this special sacred time that God has set aside for us, encourages us to use, then it's certainly the case. Now, can a, murder, a murderer be received into heaven? Can adulterers be received into heaven? Can thieves be received into heaven? Can liars be received into heaven? And we, we all know that yes, they can. Yes, they will be. Yes, they are. Because they have repented. 
because of their faith in Jesus, because of God's forgiveness for those things. But if they were to, to say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I'm going to continue to be a murderer, a thief, and a liar, then that's a different story. And so the same thing holds true when it comes to, to worshiping and holding God's word sacred for us. Because this is the place that we come to to learn about the true nature of God. We live in a culture where all kinds of people will talk about their being a God as some kind of a vague spiritual being who is out there and it doesn't matter which one you worship, it's all the same. Or there are plenty of people who are saying there is no God. And we know that there are a number of our, our young people who will leave church and, and, and go off to college and, and, and all of a sudden they're confronted with some of those kinds of thoughts and, and, and start to have doubts and questions and come back with all kinds of confusion and, and oftentimes staying away because they haven't heard the word. They haven't kept in the fold during those critical times when the people are bringing up all of these questions and issues in their minds. This is the place where we learn about God. This is the place where we learn about who Jesus really is. All these people will talk about Jesus and invoke the name of Jesus and tell us all kinds of things about Jesus that are, all, that are squirrely, that don't make any sense, that are not in accordance with the scriptures. This is the place where we learn the truth about who Jesus is and why he came. It's why the creeds are so important. We are a creedal church. We not only learn the commandments, but we also learn the promises that God gives to us in those creeds. We learn about who Jesus is. And you wouldn't learn it otherwise because it's not natural knowledge. It's not something that would come to people naturally. It only comes as God's revealed knowledge through the scriptures. And that's what we come together to, to talk about, to teach, to preach. Today's text is a perfect example. We know that Jesus is true God and true man. That's what Christmas is all about. We wouldn't know that if it were not from the scriptures. And when we see this text and see where Jesus comes into the presence of these teachers and, and he is asking them questions and listening and learning, that is Jesus in his human nature. Learning, growing, growing in wisdom, growing in stature, the scriptures say, just like we had to grow, just like we had to learn. This is Jesus' is true man. Jesus' is true God is also hinted at when it says they were astonished at his answers. Mary and Joseph didn't understand all of that. But they would as they continued to hear Jesus preach and to hear his teaching. And then, and it says that Mary pondered these things in her hearts and that later on she would bring these things up when she was a part of the, uh, of the disciples after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. As they gathered together, she would be able to share those insights and, and people would grow in their understanding and their faith and their love. This is the place where we're able to to hear that and to grow in our faith. Scriptures go on to say that Jesus going to the temple, after his going to the temple, he was submissive. So both of those things, the one is Jesus fulfilling righteousness for us by going to the temple, then later on, his, his being submissive to his parents, even though he's truly God, was him in his human nature fulfilling righteousness for us. And Jesus fulfilled righteousness for us so because we don't fulfill that righteousness. It's because of that that he is able to give us his righteousness, his forgiveness. Jesus is 12 years old when this happens. 21 years later, Jesus is 33. He goes to Jerusalem for one last time. This time when he sits and is in the presence of the teachers there, they don't praise him. They're not amazed at his teaching. They are aghast at his teaching. They call him a blasphemer. They call out for his crucifixion. Jesus didn't change. They changed. They had moved away from the word of God. 
And we know that this was all part of the plan. This was a part of the plan of salvation that we heard uh, in such eloquent language in Ephesians chapter 1. It is the plan of our salvation, our forgiveness, as Jesus was taken outside of the city and put on a cross to die in our place. Mary and Joseph looked for Jesus three days before they found him in the temple. On this last trip to Jerusalem, there would be three days where people didn't know where Jesus was at before he appeared to them after the resurrection. And when he died, the temple curtain was split in two and the, and the Holy of Holies was exposed, the place where God's glory had dwelt, and it was empty. Because the glory of God was no longer there. And it wouldn't return. It wasn't long until the whole temple was destroyed. It was empty because the glory of God, we heard in today's verse, resides in Jesus. Jesus is God with us, our Emmanuel. And, And so when Jesus says, I will be with you always, he is saying to us that we need to gather and wherever We gather, he is there in our midst in a very special way. God would be with his disciples in the upper room. Jesus would be with his disciples on the edge of the sea. But when he left, and he promises that he would be with his disciples always, it was when they gathered for worship. And in in Hebrews 10, 25, it tells us and gives us this warning. Don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together as you wait for the coming of our Savior, the wait for, for the day of the Lord. Because we need to encourage one another. We need to exhort one another. That is why we gather here together, to learn about who the true God is, but also to encourage one another, to exhort one another, to pool our resources, to help this ministry continue. See, that's what Acts 2 talks about. The fact that they they continued in the apostles' teaching and the breaking of bread and fellowship and in prayer. That's what we do in our worship services. We are fulfilling, we are continuing in what they had begun. And when Acts chapter 5 and chapter 6 come out, they they tell how the people pooled their resources so that the, the, the... the pastors and the preachers and the teachers and the apostles could at full time, not just on one day a week, full time they could be sharing the word of God with the people who needed to hear it. That's what we are about. A month ago, if you would have asked me, I would have told you we have a giving problem at Trinity because we were tens of thousands of dollars behind in our budget. Made an appeal through a letter. Our prin, pr, the, the president of our congregation came up and made an appeal to the congregation. And people responded. People proved me wrong again. We made up that deficit. We don't have a giving problem here at Trinity. But we do have an attendance problem. Five out of seven of our Advent and Christmas services, there were more people in church in 2013 than in 2014. Of our Sundays in the year 2014, 28 out of 52 Sundays, there were more people in church on Sunday in 2013 than there were in 2014. We have an attendance problem that we need to deal with. And I say we. I'm committed to it, and I'm asking you today to commit to it, too. What I'm asking you today to commit to to today, to resolve today, is to be in church, wherever you may be, whether it's here or somewhere else, to, to be resolved to be where Jesus was. This is the place where we meet Jesus. Jesus says, I wouldn't I be? I must be in my Father's house. This is where Jesus was intended to be. And I know that there's some people who are saying, well, I always already do that. I come all the time. I want you, all of you, look around. Think about it. Think that there are some people who are missing. People who you know who haven't been here in a while. And think of ways that you could invite them, not just to church, but to learn about Jesus. Because this is the place where he must be. He said, I must be in my Father's house. This is the Father's house. 
This is where we are to be too. Amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Well, we are very grateful that all of you can be here for this worship service because this is where we are to be. I always say that uh, January is a, as busy as December a lot of, in a lot of ways. And so this week, we've got a lot of things going on. Got our council meeting tomorrow night. On Tuesday night, 6.30, we'll be undecorating um, as we prepare for Epiphany. So if anybody was uh, here to decorate, we encourage you to come back. Anybody who was not able to be here then, Please come, give us a hand. It'll make the, quick, uh, the work a little quicker. On Wednesday night, I'll begin a new information class. So if there's anyone who is interested in coming back as a kind of refresher, if you know someone who would like to learn more about the Christian faith and, and, the, and the Lutheran church, um, we encourage you to come. That's 7 o'clock downstairs here. Um, next Sunday is our Epiphany concert. We look forward to that, so that'll be between services. There won't be any Bible classes on Sunday or Sunday school classes, but we'll have our concert, we'll have our children and our adult choirs uh, singing their songs uh, from the Christmas season, so that's always a lot of fun as well. Um, we have had an announcement in the earlier service I'll mention to you now too. Uh, Tim Schluter, as I mentioned in the prayers, is on his way back to Hong Kong now. He took with him 30 crosses that we were able to gather here, but the problem is, is I had committed 100 crosses. And, and 30 is a great number, a good holy number, and 70 is another holy number, and so we're going to do the rest of those 70 during, uh, probably during Lent, and, then, and, and Tim will be back at Easter time, and so if anybody has any, you can bring those by any time, but we're really going to focus on that in the Lenten season. Um, and then also the, uh, the tournament that we have down, going down at school and everything, there's a, some mention of that in the bulletin, um, that's, that's also going on right now. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Okay, well again, we're very grateful that you could be here. We do encourage you to take time to extend God's peace to the people around you, get to know one another, um, and, and hope that you'll be able to come and be a part of our services um, every week when you're in the area. I will say also, if you look in the entryway, up in the, the rack on the, side, on the east side of the, um, the entryway, there are these sheets. For those of you who are saying, you know, I'd like to read a little more of the Bible, I'd like to know more of the Bible this year than I did last year, this is a great tool. It's got all of the chapters of every book in the Bible, and you can just kind of cross them off or color them in as you read those chapters over this next year, 2015. See where you get and, and see what you learn. Um, hopefully we'll be better off and, and have a better understanding of God's word and will next year than we had this year and continue to grow. Thank you.